You are welcome to POF Television, a YouTube channel, Mr. Sovio Efik, a Nigerian in diaspora in faraway Canada. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. DJ, and thank you for your good works. Yes, uh, it's a privilege to be with you, uh, an accomplished author whose book, The Sky Cries, is making waves in Canada. Tell us a bit about this book. This book, as you can see, The Sky Cries, it's a bestseller in, um, uh, in Canada now, in Amazon, generally, that's all over the world. The book is a collection of poems. All the poems are on climate change. So it's as a result of trying to communicate the deep meaning of climate change and the impacts of climate change to better understanding of the people, the common people, those who are not technically inclined or professionally inclined to climate change issues, those who are not scientifically inclined to climate change issues. So there's a need to really address the scientific jargons that many people think climate change is all about. So we decided to come up with art, the poetry art in using it to demystify uh, climate change to the understanding of the general public. Because all, everybody will need to be to get in. We need to join in fighting climate change. It's not just for the elites. It's for everybody right down to the community level. So the poetry expressed here are in free verse, a simple language where everybody can read and understand and then can feel it because poetry conveys emotional feelings. Poetry inspires. So by the time you read it, you become emotionally inclined and emotionally inspired to take action. And that is the, the real essence of it all. It's all about the, the, the situation we find ourselves now. The, way, the disasters that we are getting from the changes in the climate, the dramatic changes in climate. So that's why we need to really do this for people to read and understand deeply what climate change means. Thank you. What would you say climate change means exactly? Yeah. But I will, I will have to explain it for better understanding the real cause of it. That's when we understand the meaning. Um, the human activity is actually responsible for the change, the dramatic changes in climate change. When I when I say human activities, is as a result of emissions of greenhouse gases from man-made activities to the atmosphere. Uh, in the in the in the atmospheric level, the Earth is the only planet that life exists. Why? Because there are greenhouse gases. The gases like methane, like carbon dioxide, like nitrous oxide, there are many. They exist naturally in the sky, in the atmosphere. They trap the heat radiation, the energies from the earth, from the sun. They trap the heat from the sun and disperse them evenly to the surface of the earth so that the earth is not too cold for life not to exist and not too hot for life not to exist. So it balances the weather and the climatic condition, the temperature condition of the earth so that things can grow and life can exist. But as a result of industrial activities of man, we have emitted a lot of these greenhouse gases to the atmosphere and they trap excess heat and disperse excess heat. And that changed the composition of the natural climatic system. And so excess heat is resulting into extreme temperature, extreme weather condition. And that's why we are having what we're having in form of heat, that people are uh, complaining in the temperate region. People are complaining in a serious winter or excess extreme wet, wet winter conditions in the polar region. People are complaining of cyclones. People are complaining of um, excess rainfall, some floods, sea level rise. 
this as a result of these changes in the climatic condition because the natural composition is referred to climate variation. It can take like 200, 300 years before you can observe a minute variation in the climatic condition. But now within one year, two years, you can see a huge dramatic change in the climatic condition. So it's as a result of human activities in the last 500 years that these changes are happening in the sky. So many people may not understand it, but we may feel it, we may see the changes. But how do you come in when you don't understand the language that is being used? So by reading through the poems here, you'll be able to understand it because it's not just the poems, it's, you can see poems and illustrations. You visualize, you read and visualize the illustration and it gets into your memory and for you to be able to have that emotional attachment to do something. We also make some of our poems in digital visuals like as the climate changes is there in youtube if you search as the climate changes by some you're going to see it in digital format of it things fall apart it's also one of the poems that you can see in youtube in the digital format which you can play and listen to it and then understand it better so you would then because what you understand propels you into action it inspires you into action it motivates you into action so that's why we come up with this how many poems are in the book, The Sky Cries? We have about 25 collections of poems in this book. Yeah. And all on climate change issues, on nature, on this particular where collection is all focusing on the impact and solution to climate change. The, 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 the entire impacts of climate change are on this title. And some of most, all the poems are having, maybe in the last stanza, you see a kind of a solution to the problem, to the impact, the particular impact that the poem is talking about. The solution is always there. And the action you can take is always there. So our second book is going to be focusing on nature and climate change. And the book is going to be called Just One Tree. The third book is going to be focusing on climate change uh, inspiration. It's going to be basically on inspiration to climate change. It's going to be called Climate Pledge. But this is the first book. And this is actually the first one we are having that came out January this year. Looking at your analysis, one will feel that industrialized environments will have more of the effect of climate change. Is that the way it is? Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, when we say industrialized environment, yeah, they will have, because they contribute more to it because of the industrial processes of emitting carbon. Also in the developing countries, a lot of technological lapses as of, as, as, uh, have led to emission of carbons into the atmosphere. For example, China is a developing country. Nigeria is, also, is an oil producing country. In fact, in Nigeria, we flay our, the, the waste gas, associated natural gas that comes from exploration of the gas, from exploration of the oil. The gas that comes up, we flay them in the sky. So it's not well, it's not well taken care of. So in many developing countries, there are environmental lapses that led to emission of carbon into the atmosphere. But the industrialized nations are actually more responsible because they also emit carbon into the atmosphere in large quantity. And now the quantity of carbon in the atmosphere is about, as of 2023, it was about 412 parts per million as against the safe limit that is supposed to be 350 parts per million. That would be the safe limit. Now we've exceeded. And so we need to do a lot to bring down the quantity of carbon emissions from the atmosphere. This is why we need to look at various ways of educating the people, of promoting climate literacy, climate change understanding, promoting climate actions. Last week, I had the opportunity of uh, Pre uh, speaking to the graduate students at the, at the University of Western Ontario in Canada here. Yeah? Um, there was an annual graduate student conference that took place in the university, and I was invited to make a presentation titled 
inspiring climate literacy and climate action through art. So I had to, because expression through art is always emotional. It conveys a lot of emotional feelings, emotional messages. So by the time you use an artwork like this to express climate change, people will be interested. People will understand, will listen. They will watch the video on the YouTube and really understand it. They will read the book and look at the visuals and understand it very well. So I also presented my book there uh, at the conference to the graduate students. And as a way of also promoting climate literacy, you know, among the students, because most of the graduate students are going to be lecturers. They are going to be working in environment related fields. So when they grasp this very well, they will be able to also go along with it. When they grasp the knowledge of uh, climate change, they will be able to propagate it very well. Yeah. Is there anything like uh, knowing which country or countries are contributing more to the to what is going on in the climate? That is the process of climate change. There are a lot of countries like that from um, statistics who say, oh, America, it's uh, emitting more. Oh, China is also emitting more. But um, politics have come into most of these issues. There are certain campaigns that said polluter pays principle. They call it polluter pay principle. Those who pollute more, we have to also contribute more to the solution. And then there's what we call nationally determined contributions. At the, because that's what we normally go to negotiate at the United Nations conference, uh, conference of parties. Now, the nationally determined contributions is for the developing countries. Because the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change states that um, the developing countries may not be mandated because of lean resources in terms of finance and capacity, technological capacity. So they may not have to be mandated to take action. The developed countries, they have the technological capacity. They have the finance. So they are mandated to take action and support financially the developing countries but developing countries cannot just sit quiet and fold their arms when they are also contributing especially some developing countries they cut down trees in the forest they deforest their forest and then deforestation also, deforestation also emits uh, carbon into the atmosphere so nationally determined contributions from the developing countries let us know what you are able to do to reduce your own Climate, uh, your own uh, footprint, climate change footprint. What what do you have to do? You must bring it to the uh, to the uh, table. Let all countries assess it. So Nigeria have its own. All the developing countries they have their own NDCs. Come up with your own plan of action to reduce your carbon footprint. So countries are doing that because we need to reduce the temperature level at least to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Because anything more than 1.5 degrees Celsius, it will be a kind of a conflagration. So the, the wall is working towards making sure that the temperature level is not in the next, in 2050, the temperature of, uh, level must be at least lower than 1.5 degrees Celsius because the way it is now is almost one degree Celsius. And you can see what the effect, you can see the disaster we are having. So if it's more than one degree Celsius, up to two degrees Celsius, Man, it's going to be a disaster. It's going to be a serious disaster. So countries are actually emitting, but the same developed nations are also actually working on transforming their uh, technologies into renewable energy-based technologies or renewable energy-driven technologies. Some people are adopting 100% renewable, renewables. You can see that we are having zero vehicles emissions coming up these days. All right. So Countries are doing a lot. Developing countries too are doing a lot. We need to reduce, each country has to reduce its own carbon footprint. Each country has to adopt a, a climate mitigation agenda to make sure that they work towards it and bring it down. If you need, if you need some funds, there are some basket, basket funds that some developing countries can access to use it to bring down their carbon footprint so that 
we can have a climate friendly world. We can have a post carbon caring society in the next 50 years, in the next 100 years. Statistics shows that over 2 billion people are not aware of climate change. Mm -hmm. If you read the introduction to my book, you will see all the statistics. Some professors have actually conducted, there's a professor, Anthony Louis Ries from uh, uh, in the US, has done a lot of research to show that over 2 billion are not aware of climate change. And 65% of that comes from developing countries. They are not aware. So we need to do a lot in terms of promoting climate literacy and climate education to, for people to understand it and then take action. If it's about planting just one tree. See, the book is not just a book for you to read and dump it. It's a book that will take you into action. If you look at the back of the book, there's what I call climate pledge. You sign this pledge and send it to us. You can do it online by using this QR. There's a QR here. You use your phone to capture this. It takes you to the website. The website is www.climateconnect.global. It takes you there. You fill the form. The climate pledge is simply that I hereby make my climate pledge today to plant just one tree in my lifetime to ensure that the sky cries no more of carbon suffocation on planet Earth. By the time you read this and take this pledge and sign it, then you plant a tree in your backyard, in your garden, or in, in the parks and gardens. You can approach the, any city parks and gardens, like Lagos State. We have Lagos State parks and gardens. A lot of states in Nigeria are also having that agency. You approach them, they, you buy a nursery from them, they give you a space where you can plant. You take a picture of that tree you have planted, do a video of it, go to the website, upload it with your email, who we'll, we'll assess them, who we'll assess the information, and then we'll get back to you and engage you on an online climate class where we have to educate you on climate mitigation, climate adaptation, climate justice, renewable energy, nature and climate change, soil re uh, regenerative agriculture, or soil, re uh, soil health, regenerative agriculture, climate smart agriculture. We take you on all those things on clim online climate class. We also have what we call open mic uh, poetry cafe. Open mic poetry cafe is online. We're going to be doing it on Zoom. So every end of the month, people send in their, poet, their poems on nature, on climate change, on environment, on ecosystems. You understand? Then we assess all those poems and then we fix it, schedule a date. People gather online and you read your poem out. At the end of the year, all the poems that we gather will be compiled into anthology. We'll give it a title. We'll compile it into anthologies so people can assess such book, right? And be reading about the poems and, and broaden their knowledge about climate change and the solution to fighting climate change. And then the names of the people that would have planted trees, names of the people that would have been engaged in renewable energy, the names of the people that will be engaged in recycling will compile them, right? And then at the end of the year, when we are going for United Nations Conference of Parties, we will now present those names there to show that these people from the community level to the top, they are contributing to fighting climate change. And that will encourage the global citizens to take action, right? It will encourage a lot of people to take action. So we also have another program we call Climate Arts Exhibition. You send in your paintings on environment, on nature, on climate change, on ecosystems, on water, on these, on plastics. You send in your paintings. You send in your sculptures. You send in your drawings. You send in your videos. Right? We present it online at the end of the month. Every month we present it on our online climate arts exhibition program. People see it and then we we'll compile them together to encourage the work of arts on climate change because arts also is a language that people can engage and, and broaden their knowledge and understanding on climate change. So these are the programs one will use in promoting climate literacy, in promoting climate action so that we can start having the global population that are actually engaging seriously and fighting climate change for us to have a post-carbon caring society in the next couple of um, 50 or 100 years.
He continued to use the pronoun we, we, we. Mm. Who are the we? The we is referring to the Global Climate Connect, the non-profit that has been set up. After publishing this book, the non-profit organization or NGO, you can call it NGO, non-governmental non organization has been set up. So we call it Global Climate Connect. The website is there in the book at the, at the last page. It's www.climateconnect.global. So the non-profit is made up of some personalities, some climate change experts that came together with me for us to set it up in Canada here. So those are the activities we're engaging, which I've explained. The climate class, the open mic uh, climate poetry, and then the climate arts exhibition. Those are the activities we do. And then every summer we'll be having a, a summer class for children. Because here in Canada and other developed countries, every summer holiday for that three to four months, children have to be engaged in something. You cannot just keep them at home like that. It's that they go for excursion. So we tend to organize a climate summer class for the children. It could be a one month summer class where we also educate the children on issues of climate change for children to, to have a role to play, to take action in fighting off this climate crisis. Yeah, tell us, yeah. how has this book done after its publication in Canada and across the world? Yeah, after it was published in Canada on Amazon, it was published by Global Book Publishing Company is being sold by Amazon. And on Amazon, it won number one 21st century poetry uh, sales. That's why it became under the category, 21st century poetry category, this book became number one. So that's why it became a bestseller. And I became the best-selling author. And I'm so happy about that because this is my first book. And for my first work to be a bestseller, I really appreciate that means it shows that people are interested in this work and more uh, more books are coming. By, by this coming summer, my second book titled Just One Tree will be out. And then towards the end of the year, the third book, Climate Pledge, will be out. Right. And so... I'm also involved in a lot of uh, anthologies with other associations, with professional bodies, like the Immigrant Writers Association. I'm going to be doing one or two anthologies. Uh, I will contribute one or two poems into the yearly anthology book. For, for example, this year's anthology, I'm going to be one of the authors there. Thank you. So these are, the, these are what we do here in Canada to make sure that um, we will promote climate literacy and climate action around the world. You are a climate activist, Nigerian based in Canada. How will the Nigerian population uh, benefit from your expertise? Yeah, I'm actually consulting and networking with a number of uh, book distribution and uh, distributors. I'm also looking for book distributing companies that I can, we can work hard things for to make sure that this book gets to African countries where there are no Amazon or other parts of the world where Amazon is not available so that they can access them in bookshops, in libraries, in schools and other places, in the airports and you know, everywhere. So book distribution, distributing companies are good in that. So once I come, I, I get in touch with any of them, you know, strike a contract whereby they assess this and then take it there for people to uh, assess, to reach out to. But for now, we are on my own personal level. I've been trying to get some copies of the books and send to sister organizations in Nigeria and other parts of Africa for them to use for advocacy, right? Uh, for now, we are just using the book for advocacy so that it can have a wider outreach. Um, by the time we also get these book distributing companies, they will be able to get them in appropriate places for people to access in a very cheap amount. Because the purpose is not just to make sales, but it is to make sure that it reaches the people. But I thank God that on Amazon, we're able to make sales 
that make the book a, be a bestseller. Yeah. Now, Nigerian government is looking forward to having more refineries and all that. What is the implication of this over climate change? Yeah, there is a campaign called Break Free Campaign, Break Free from Fossil Fuels. Yeah, there are some, the country, because oil is our main, it is the mainstay of our economy. We cannot just say we should bury it. We can't advise the Nigerian government to bury it because it's going to cause a lot of economic woes in Nigeria, poverty will set in. So what we what we are campaigning for is that the Nigerian government should use sustainable practices in exploring the oil, in doing the oil marketing, so that we don't um, we don't emit more carbon into the atmosphere. I know we rely on fuel, but we should also take to these uh, zero emission vehicles. We should also take to renewable uh, solar energy, we should take to all these uh, winged energy turbines and see how we can reduce our dependency on fossil fuel based activities to renewable energy based activities. I know it's not going to happen in a day in one fuel swap. It's just going to happen gradually because it, re it requires technology and it requires uh, technical capacity. But we're going to get there. Well, the way we are doing, the way we are educating people now, we're going to get there. The government is also getting uh, doing a lot in that respect. For example, we would have to stop flaring the gas because when you explore the oil from the, when you drill it from the ground, the gas that comes out that escape from it are being channeled into a pipe and then flay it in the burn it in the atmosphere. That's not good. We need to. That's why the Nigerian government came up with a, a project of re reutilization of such gases. That's why we have the NLG. They reutilize those gases for NLG, but it's not enough. So we we still a lot of sites, a lot of uh, oil exploration sites are there still flaring. So many oil companies are still flaring. So we need to stop that number one, and then we need to look at what the energy sector. How is Nigeria transitioning? from the brown energy to clean energy. So that's why there's a campaign called Just Transition. How is Nigeria going to transit, transition by carrying everybody along? You don't transition and the poor will suffer. You, you don't transition and the children will suffer. So Nigerian government is actually working on that to make sure that at, at least one of my senior colleagues is the chairman of Nigerian Council on Climate Change, NCCC, Dr. Salis Udayo. I've worked with him and I know he's capable of doing it. He's driving the, 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 the machinery and he's going he's gonna to do well. He's going gonna, gonna, gonna to take Nigeria to greater heights in terms of a just transitioning from fossil fuel based technology to renewable energy based technology for Nigeria. Thank you very much, Mr. Efik Sovio. We look forward to joining you when you launch your next two books. Have a beautiful day. Thank you day. so much. And I'm you too. Bye. People of the Fountain.